that it is, Lord, to be a part of your church. Lord, we thank you for the kids in our community. We pray for them and for the teachers during this time. Lord, we pray that your spirit would be working in the hearts and the minds of the kids and the teachers, Lord, as they build them up into the image of your son, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. So sermon's going to be in English. If you need, if you'd like translation into Thai, the translation devices are at the back. All right. Well, hello everybody. Hope your weeks have been have been well. We've been looking at the book of Daniel over the past few weeks, and I don't think I, I think I speak for all of us when I say it's been quite the whirlwind. The past few chapters have been just vision after vision, discouragement after discouragement. Even though we've seen that one of the main themes of the book of Daniel is that God is king and that no matter what happens, God is still in control. The past few chapters have felt like one punch after another. Well, today, um, today is no different. We have another vision. Now, the good news is that this is the last vision in the book of Daniel. The only thing is, is that it's three chapters long. That's right, chapters 10 to 12 is one long vision, the longest vision in the book of Daniel. So I'll, I'll read the text to us. Next slide, please. Thank you. All right, Daniel chapter 10. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a word was revealed to Daniel, who was named Belshazzar. And the word was true, and it was a great conflict. And he understood the word and had understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. I ate no delicacies, no meat or wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all for the full three weeks. On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, that is, the Tigris, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a man clothed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Upaz around his waist. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great trembling fell upon them, and they fled to hide themselves. So I was left alone and saw this great vision and had no strength, no strength was left in me. My radiant appearance was fearfully changed, and I retained no strength. Then I heard the sound of his words, and as I heard the sound of his words, I fell on my face in deep sleep with my face to the ground. And behold, a hand touched me and sent me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly loved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for now I have been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. Then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me twenty-one days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia and came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days. For the vision is for days yet to come. When he had spoken to me according to these words, I turned my face toward the ground and was mute. And behold, one in the likeness of the children of man touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke. I said to him who stood before me, O my Lord, by reason of the vision, pains have come upon me and I retain no strength. How can my Lord's servant talk with my Lord? For now no strength remains in me, and no breath is left in me. 
Again, having, one having the appearance of a man touched me and strengthened me. And he said, O man greatly loved, fear not. Peace be with you. Be strong and of good courage. And as he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. Then he said, Do you know why I have come to you? But now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. But I will tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth. There is none who contends by my side against these except Michael, your prince. This is the word of the Lord. Now let's read that again in Thai. I'm just kidding. So, so to recap, so far, Daniel is in Babylon. And he has been here for the majority of his life. The Israelites have been in exile for close to 70 years under different empires. In chapter 9 that we looked at last week, Daniel is in his late 80s. And having spent his whole life in exile, he turns to God and he asks, How long? How long until my people can go back to Israel? How long must we be in exile? God answers something along the lines of, Soon. A short time after chapter 9, Babylon falls to another empire, the empire of the Medes and the Persians. And in our chapter for today, we see it says, Cyrus, king of Persia, is now in power. So Cyrus ended the exile and he allowed for the Jews to return to Jerusalem. And so we see this in Ezra chapter 1. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia. And it goes, goes on to say, basically saying that anyone can go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. So that's the context. And there's joy, there's excitement as the Israelites prepare to make the trip back. Exile is over. But Daniel stays behind. He's too old to make the trip back. He's probably around 90 years of age at this time. And so two years pass because we see in verse 1 it says, it is now the third year of Cyrus, which means it's about 535 to 536 BC. And we know from Ezra that during this time, things are not going well in Jerusalem. The Jews had started to rebuild the temple, but they were threatened and discouraged. They faced opposition. And so they could not continue their work. It's quite likely that Daniel had heard these reports. And so he is overwhelmed and he's discouraged. And so he grieves. And on the 24th day, as he's mourning, he goes for a walk. He stands on the bank of the great river. And he is met with something so amazing it sends him to the ground. He is undone. And this text, if we, if we read carefully, it shows us something very profound. We'll ask questions like, who does he meet? What does he say? How is Daniel changed? What do we learn? And so we're going to look at this text through three images. One, the messenger. Two, the battle. Three, the warrior. So the messenger. Verse 5 tells us that as Daniel is on the riverbank, he lifts his eyes up and meets a figure so amazing and glorious that everyone runs away in fear. And Daniel himself is sent to the ground on his face. It says, A man clothed in linen, with a belt of fine gold around his waist, his body like barrel, his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, the sound of his words like the sound of a crowd. Who does Daniel meet? Daniel meets an angel of the Lord. Now the angel represents God in two ways. One, by declaring the words of God. But two, look at the appearance of the angel. It's, it's very similar to how Jesus is described in Revelation. So similar that if the angel doesn't say anything, it would have been very easy to say, Oh, yeah, this is, this is God. This is Jesus. But later... As we'll see, the angel will tell Daniel that he was delayed in coming to him. And Michael, another angel, came to help him. And so that's why, that's why it's an angel and not God. Because God is omnipotent. 
which means he is all powerful and he doesn't need any help. So one commentator says that the angel is filled with the glory and power and dread of God. And therefore to look at this angel is to see something about the God who sends him. That's, that's why the angel looks so similar. Now I'd like to just stop here for a second and bring out something that's quite amazing in this. The angel reflects God's glory in such a way that when Daniel looks at the angel, he is sent to the ground and those who are with him run away in fear. The angel is not God, but the angel is like a mirror reflecting God's greatness and power and glory and awesomeness. The angel is reflecting God's image. Now in his book, The Weight of Glory, C.S. Lewis gets at this when he writes, It's a serious thing to remember that the dullest, most uninteresting person you can talk to may one day be a creature with, if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship, or else a horror and a corruption such as now you meet, if at all, only in a nightmare. He goes on to say, There are no such thing as ordinary people. He says, you, meaning all of us, you've never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilizations, these are mortal. But it is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. Immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. Next to the blessed sacrament itself, he continues, your neighbor is the holiest object presented to your senses. And if he is your Christian neighbor... He is holy in almost the same way, for in him also Christ, the glorifier and the glorified, glory himself, is truly hidden. What's he saying? The Bible tells us that because we are all created in God's image, we reflect to a degree the glory and holiness of God. First John 3 says, Now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet made, been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And this, is this is what it means to be a Christian. Christianity is like a diamond. There's a thousand different faces, and they all look into the same reality. But they all show you reality from a different perspective. And so here's one more perspective of what it means to be a Christian. One more great definition of Christianity. To be a Christian does not mean to try to be a child of God, but it means to be a child of God now. It's very typical of people to say, when they're asked, are you a Christian, to, to respond, oh, I'm trying, I hope so, I hope I'm a Christian, I'm trying to be a Christian. But what we see here is that Christianity is a standing. It's a legal position. It's not us saying, I'm trying to be God's child. John says we are children of God. There's no such thing as a 50% child. Either a child is legally yours or is not. And so to be a child of God is a standing. It's something that comes on to you. It's just like when, Daniel, when the angel tells Daniel in verse 11 that he is greatly loved. Daniel is not trying to be loved. He just is. It's something that has come on to him. This is what it means to be a Christian. It means to be loved by God. It means to be a child of God. And we are destined, if you are a Christian, the climax of our lives is to see God as he is, face to face. One day we will experience the complete transformation that occurs from seeing God face to face. So the same greatness and glory and power of the angel that appears to Daniel is just an image of what we will be like when we see God face to face. It means it's, it's so amazing, it's astonishing, that is our future. So Daniel sees the glory of God reflected in the angel and he falls to the ground on his face. Instead of being overwhelmed, exhilarated by the experience, he is so drained of energy, he can't talk, he goes unconscious, so that three times the angel has to revive him, to bring him back. He says in verse 8, I was left alone and saw this great vision and no strength was left in me. My radiant appearance was fearfully changed and I retained no strength. And so what we see here is the difference between believing in God as a concept and God as a reality. The difference between believing in God and actually experiencing God's glory. 
When Daniel saw the angel, he didn't just say, oh yeah, there is a God. Why? Because he already believed. But when Daniel saw the angel, he fell to the ground. Why did he fall to the ground? That's the difference between God as a concept and God as a reality. The difference is glory. God as a concept is lighter than you, lighter than me. So if God comes into our life and is only a concept, we shape God. God fits in with our existing patterns. God doesn't move us around. If we believe in God and it hasn't changed us very much, God is just a concept. God as a concept cannot change our beliefs around. It just fits in with what we already believe. So like, I believe the way to be happy is to have a nice house, kids, and a car. And God can help me get it. Or, I believe in God because it makes sense why everything is here. There must have been a creator. Or, I believe in God because in the future we're going to be with, we're going to be, God with, we're going to be with God in heaven. Those, those are all concepts. That's just believing in God as a concept. And God is just there to help us achieve what we already believe in. So plenty of people try to be religious. We come to church, read the Bible, and pray. Why? Because we need help in getting to our goals. In other words, fitting God into our agenda. This is God as a concept. But God as a reality is heavier than us. When the real God comes into our life, when we get into the presence of God's glory, things get shaken up. We fall to the ground. We become deeply, deeply changed by God's word. Look at Daniel. He's only in the presence of an angel that reflects God's glory. And he's on the ground. He's shaken up. It says, verse 8, his radiant appearance was fearfully changed. Why? Because God has more glory than our beliefs. Instead of, instead of God being fit, and to our agenda, God becomes our agenda. He radically changes our priorities. Without God, our agenda is to have a nice, comfortable, safe kind of life, putting ourselves and our families first. But when God comes into our life, our priorities are shaken up. God becomes our agenda. God says bravery, self-sacrifice. Sacrifice your individual needs. I am more real than your individual needs. I have glory. Is God a reality in our lives? Is God only a concept? Do you remember when God moved from being a concept to a reality? Is God contradicting you? Is God changing you? Has he completely demolished and rebuilt the way that we look at life and our agenda and our priorities? So Daniel, so the angel comes to Daniel. Daniel's knocked to the ground. And now what does the angel say? What is the message? This is our second image. It's the battle. So in verses 10 to 14, we see the angel giving Daniel the strength to stand upright to hear the message. So Daniel, he's on his hands and knees. He gets up slowly to hear the words of the angel. And what we hear is absolutely astonishing. In verse 12, the angel says, Fear not, Daniel, from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, I have come because of your words. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, but I had help from Michael, one of the chief princes. I have come to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days. <clears throat> what we have here is something that the modern person, especially if you are in Bangkok, what we have here is something that most people scoff about. Spiritual warfare. This is the clearest example in all the Bible of what is called a territorial spirit. We see it says, the prince of the kingdom of Persia. And so we see here that there are supernatural beings that are opposed to God. And it seems like at least one is assigned to a kingdom. We see here it says Persia. A little later we'll see, we'll see it says Greece. So presumably, his job is to darken the people of Persia, to keep them from having the truth and the light of God's word. Now there's a big difference between people who live in Bangkok and people who live in other parts of Thailand in regards to how we view spiritual warfare. The modern person in Bangkok says, 
Everything has a natural cause and has a scientific explanation. If everything has a natural cause, then evil, crime, injustice, cruelty, they all have a natural cause. They can all be explained. And so we'll say things like, oh yes, we can figure it out. It's just bad education, the bad education system. It's how we were raised as we were kids. Those are the things that cause evil. And we can fix it. So most, most of the people, most modern people, most of the people in Bangkok, scoff at the idea of evil. But if we look at the world, can we really say that the Holocaust, ethnic cleansing, serial killing is just a result of bad psychology? We cannot account for the depth and pervasiveness of evil by just saying bad psychology or bad systems. The Bible doesn't say this either. The Bible says evil comes from the free will of two races of beings that God created. Angels and humans. Some of the angels fell and turned away from God. The fallen angels are Satan and his demons. Personal supernatural beings. And then we also have the human race. We turned and sin and evil is in our heart. It's in our souls. It has spiritual roots. And so our psychology, the way we were raised, can shape the innate evils, evil in our hearts, and it can make it worse, but it doesn't create it. And so plenty of cultures in the world believe that there is such a thing as a devil, that there is evil, that there are supernatural forces at work in the world. If you go to Isan, you'll see this very clearly. It may make us uncomfortable, but it is true. There is a devil and supernatural beings that oppose God, that influence the events throughout history. There is a spiritual battle. And we see this with the words that the angel tells Daniel. He says, The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. Later he'll say, I will return against the fight. I'll return to fight against the prince of Persia. So there is such a thing as evil, and, and if we don't understand this, we won't be able to understand or defeat alone the evil and darkness in our own hearts, in our families, in our city, in the world. We're in over our heads if God is not helping us. So C.S. Lewis in his book, Screw Tape Letters, he says that when thinking about angels and demons, there are two errors that we can fall into. One is being overly and unhealthily interested in angels and demons. We're always looking at, we're always looking and trying to figure out what's going on. So that we imagine that all the sin and temptations we face in the world are really just the work of demons, twisting our thoughts and hearts all the time, leading us into temptation. We may say, I sinned, but a demon made me do it. It's like blaming the dog that ate your homework. That's one error, thinking about it too much. The other opposite error is failing to recognize the presence of these things, to not believe in them at all. One you can call superstition, the other one you can call it unbelief. Overbelief, underbelief. Now the Bible tells us in Ephesians 6 that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, authorities, powers of this dark world against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And so we see with Daniel, he's praying, the angel comes and is detained, but eventually fights the dark forces and reaches Daniel. And what is more we see, it says in verse 12, the angel comes because of your words, because of Daniel's words. The angel comes to Daniel in response to Daniel's prayer. In other words, Daniel's prayer is answered. There is, there is, just pause a minute, there is great power in prayer. John Piper points out that the angel's struggle with the Persian prince lasted the same amount of time that Daniel's fasting and prayer did. He continues, this is his words, he says, The reason for this is that warfare in the spirit realm was being fought in a real sense through Daniel's prayer. Now there's a lot we can say here, go into a whole nother sermon on it, but for the sake of time, just notice Daniel's posture when he prays. The angel says, you've set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God. 
Daniel's posture before God is humility. God is not a concept to Daniel. God is a reality. Daniel doesn't pray to God expecting God to be Daniel's personal secretary or his personal genie answering every prayer. Instead, Daniel's life has shown us that God has come in and rearranged Daniel's priorities. Daniel has been deeply changed by God. And so when Daniel prays, he prays and he humbles himself before God. Which means that for us, when we pray, we don't pray in order to get things from God. We pray in order to get more of God himself. We submit ourselves to God's will. So Tim Keller, in his book on prayer, he says something like, If we only ever prayed according to our own inner needs and psychology, we would never produce all the different kinds of prayers that we see in the Bible. We can only pray properly if we are responding in prayer according to who God is in Scripture. We must not decide how to pray based on what types of prayer are the most effective for producing the feelings we want. We pray in response to God Himself. And what he's saying is when we pray, we don't pray with ourselves as the focal point. We don't pray with ourselves as the center. We pray with God's will and God's word being the center. Our prayer comes as a way of responding to God. And that's what Daniel does. He humbles himself before God and he prays and then the angel comes to him. And then in verses 15 to 21, in response to the angel's words, Daniel is struck with fear and discouragement. He falls to the ground again and he's mute. And he says in verse 16, O my Lord, by reason of the vision, pains have come upon me and I retain no strength. How many of us have felt that way before? We've heard news that has caused our hearts to sink. We've heard terrifying news being weighed down by the evil and injustice and suffering that we see in the world today. Some of us are in professions of social work and so we see that a lot more. We see the evil in our own social circles. We see betrayals and backstabbings by our friends. We see evil in our families as well. Family drama is always there. And we also see evil in our own hearts. Daniel hears of the battle, this cosmic spiritual battle that deeply impacts him. And he's on the ground. He's drained of all energy. What Daniel 10 does it gives us an image of this spiritual battle. But this battle is one that has been fought for thousands of years. It started in Genesis 3. Behind Adam and Eve's rebellion against God was the instigation of the serpent, of Satan himself. And that's the main way that the devil works against us as well. It's through lying. He lied to and deceived Adam and Eve. And he does that to us as well. The devil does not make a good person bad, but he makes flawed people worse. He gets at us through lies. We all feel this battle. We all take part in this battle. There's an old book. It's called Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices. It's written by a man named Thomas Brooks. In it, he outlines several ways that Satan tries to get at us. See if you recognize any. One, trying to get at us, trying to get us to look at the short-term pleasure of what we will do, hide from us the long-term misery that comes from it. Getting us to see other people's sin, especially Christian leaders, and saying, oh, they did it too. Nobody is really that pure, so it's okay for me to do it. Another one is emphasizing God's mercy so that we say, go ahead and sin. God will forgive you. That's his job. Another one is making people bitter over suffering so that we say, ah, I've suffered. Look at how hard I've worked. I deserve this. Nobody knows how hard I have worked and how much I have sacrificed. So I can sin a little bit. I deserve this. Nobody knows. Another one is showing Christians how bad people seem to have very good lives. So we tell ourselves, I might as well do it. I'm not getting anything out of following God, following the rules. I might as well do it. Another one is getting us to compare one part of our life to another. Like, look at me, I'm very good. 
I pray, I spend time reaching out to people, I give my time to people in need. So what if I sin a little bit over here? The rest of me is good. Another one is, I come to church, I pray, I serve other people, I deserve God's blessing. God should bless me. These are just some ways Satan gets at us through lying. This is the self-talk that happens. Satan also gets at us by causing us to look at our sin more than our Savior. We think things like, I have sinned so much, God can never forgive me. Or we think that God is punishing us when we suffer. So we say, God is mad at me. This would never have happened if God was not mad. Or we think that we are the only ones who have certain thoughts and feelings. We'll say things like, oh, I can't believe what I'm thinking. A real Christian would not think like that, would they? See, these are all accusations. These are all lies that cause us to look more at our sin than Jesus. Do you recognize any of these in yourself? Learn which ones you fall to and fight. This is what we're fighting. This is the battle, the schemes of the devil. This is what we see in the angel's message to Daniel, that there is a real battle. When there is conflict and bitterness amongst Christians, it is so important to remind ourselves that we are not fighting each other. When the world sees Christians in conflict, taking each other to court, what do you think they would think? Their Jesus isn't powerful enough to reconcile? Those Christians are just like us. They aren't any different. There is a battle being waged, and our enemy is the devil. It is not each other. And you know what? The hardest battle is not one that's out there. It's the one that's in our own hearts. It's not easy to fight evil in another person, right? But it's ridiculously hard to fight the evil in our own hearts, to face the reality that we have to battle against our vicious and destructive thoughts, our emotions, our actions. Paul gets at this when he writes in Romans 7, When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another, work, another law at work in me, waging war against me, making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? It's ridiculously hard. How do we fight it? Now one last thing. The heart of Daniel 10 is this message. The heart of Daniel 10. No matter how bad the conflict is, God fights for his people. In verses 18 to 21, before the angel gets into his message, he tells Daniel, There is none who contends by my side except against these except Michael, your prince. What he's doing is he's reminding Daniel that Israel has a champion in heaven that's fighting for Israel, Michael. The battle that began in Genesis 3, good against evil, is not being fought alone. Israel has a champion, champion in heaven fighting for them. God is fighting for them. And in the New Testament, we see that the ultimate champion in heaven took on flesh, came to earth to fight Satan himself. Jesus Christ, our champion in heaven, took on flesh, went to the cross, and accomplished the greatest victory, defeating death and Satan by dying on the cross. Jesus put an end to that battle once and for all. And this is the gospel. The battle is won not through killing, but by dying. Not by greed, not by oppression, not by hate, but by love and sacrifice. Colossians 2 tells us that on the cross, Jesus disarmed the powers and authorities, making a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. The final blow to end this ancient battle that has been raging ever since the beginning of time. The final blow was struck against the powers of death and the devil when Jesus Christ was struck on the cross. Three days later, he rose from the grave. God resurrected him, and through Jesus' resurrection, he is now leading a victory parade to heaven. That's the gospel. So there's a story, a legend in Thai history, that speaks about a certain leader in Chiang Rai. So a few hundred years ago, there was a battle 
between Chiang Rai and Burma. The kingdom of Burma had surrounded the city. And the leader, not wanting his people to die, he sends a letter to the leader of Burma, challenging the leader to a battle. Settle it one-on-one. -on -one. So they gather at the bank of the river, and it's a diving contest. The leader of Chiang Rai, the leader of Burma, they would both dive down. Whoever comes up first loses. And so everyone's watching them. They both jump into the river. They both go down. After a while, the leader of Burma comes up first. The leader of Chiang Rai never came up. He had tied a stone to himself when he jumped in. He gave his life so that his people would not die, and that by doing so, the war was over. They won. Friends, we are in a battle. It seems terrifying and dreadful. Discouragement, depression, it may seem like evil demons are positioning themselves around every corner of life. But friends, this war has been won by our champion, Jesus Christ. Now, if we believe that we are saved by living a good life, if we believe that we just have to follow the rules, be a good person, don't sin, and then God will bless me. If we really believe we can save ourselves through our effort and our performance, we will sometimes either feel like a sinner and depressed and guilt-stricken and not good enough, or we will sometimes feel loved and accepted. If we're doing good, we'll feel good. If we're doing bad, we'll feel terrible. But if we believe the gospel, that Jesus Christ died for you on the cross as your substitute, that he took the penalty for sin so that when you believe in him, all of your guilt is put on him, absorbed there, and all of his righteousness is brought to you so that you're loved and accepted in him. It completely defeats any strategy that Satan can get to you. You put on the gospel. You say, I am such a sinner that God had to die for me. He had to do that, and yet I am so loved I am so deeply loved, completely accepted in Christ that he was willing to do that for me. Put on the gospel. If we are feeling unworthy, if any of us, of us here are feeling unworthy, feeling like nobody can ever love us, God can't love us, other people can't love us, feeling that we don't have any worth or value, feeling like a failure, feeling like I'll never be what I should be, there's only one remedy for this. It's to look to Jesus Christ, our champion, when the devil comes to us with accusations, we can tell him, go to my Jesus. He has paid for me fully. Let's put on the gospel and let's stand. We are to fight. But we are to fight knowing that Jesus Christ, our champion, has already won. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we, we thank you, Lord, for the victory, the ultimate victory, Lord. You've conquered sin. You've conquered evil and darkness. Lord, we thank you for the truth, Lord, of your word. Lord, that you completely love us and you are willing and even glad to, to die for us, Lord. We pray that through the power of your spirit, you would make this a reality for us, Lord, so that we would, we would not live on the basis of our performance, but we would live on the basis of yours, Lord Jesus. We thank you for this praise in your name. Amen.